Hello, hello, and welcome to Beyond Aesthetic, the business of beauty. Today, we have a very, very special guest who's no stranger to many of you, the incomparable Terry Ross, founder and CEO of Terry Ross Consulting and president of Aesthetics, is going to turn up the heat on business analytics. Terry is a world-renowned practice management expert, thought leader, and high-performance sales coach for both medical aesthetics practices and Fortune 500 medical aesthetics companies. She's helped thousands of practices launch, grow, and scale upwards of 2.5 million in one year and has been retained by several Fortune 500 companies in the aesthetic space to train their sales teams as well as deliver keynote presentations. The title of this episode is Data is Sexy. How knowing your numbers and the top KPIs can 10 times your business and empower your team. Please help me warmly welcome Terry. So thank you so much for having me. I always um, love the opportunity to, you know, collaborate with people such as yourselves and bring expertise and knowledge and experience to the industry. So I'll date myself many, many, many years right out of college. So I've worked for a you know, division of Johnson and Johnson um, at the Con Endo. I've, I've been in multiple therapeutic areas. So I think that was my first opportunity to learn business and run teams. Yes. And um, then I had an opportunity to uh, start Terry Ross Consulting back in 2012 working with, you know, several practices across the country and, and really learning the internal workings of a practice, both in plastic surgery and medical spas, in addition to being a managing partner of one myself that eventually sold to a, a big, a very large chain. So, you know, I think I've, I've worn, you know, what lends to some of my credibility is I've worn every hat uh, within the aesthetic space and, um, really have learned what works and what doesn't and how practices can scale and, you know, where, where some of their challenges are and more importantly, how to overcome them. Wonderful. And you yourself, just tell us a little bit more about you. Oh God, Midwest girl from Detroit. <laughs> Go blue. I don't know what I, team I'll say. I'll keep it. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I've always, again, just, you know, I wanted to be a doctor when I was a little girl. I preferred the business side of things out of college. And, um, like I said, I've worked in many therapeutic areas and got into aesthetics in 2007. So it's been a really, really long time. It's my passion to help practices thrive and again, be efficient and be profitable. I'm a single mom. Most people know my little daughter, Sloan. She's 10. Um, I live in Los Angeles and yeah, that's my, my, my private life. I, I travel all over the world. I do probably, you know, 26, 27 shows a year lecturing uh, which I'm honored to do. And uh, yeah, I just really studied the industry. And again, very blessed to be humbled to work with many of the societies and and my clients, you know who you are. And if you're not, I love yeah. that you support me so much, um, you know, through all your endeavors as well. Oh, wonderful. So thank you. And um, so now let's get to some of the business at hand, some of the uh, questions that we wanted to ask you. Sure. So uh, why is it so important for med spas to understand their data? You know, what, look, I mean, whether it's medical spas or a plastic surgery practice, right? I mean, or anything in life, sports, your, you know, your, your schoolwork, you know, data, I kind of took some notes here. So if you think about your business, and I say this often, you're, you are an entrepreneur, which means we have to be smart about it. Even if you don't like it and you're scared of it, data is scary. But without knowing the data, how do we know how we're doing, how we're performing, uh, what kind of clients we want? You know, how are we improving our customer service? How are we managing our marketing dollars, spending, you know, spending the money in the right areas? How do we know what those conversion rates are? What our cost of acquisition is? I can go on and on about why data? How do we predict our trends? How do we forecast and predict revenue? We can't do any of, any of those functions without really taking a good hard look at the data. And I think what tends to happen is it's a very shiny, uh, you know, it is space. So there's new toys and, you know, new marketing channels and this CRM and this website company and this device. And we need those things to run our business. But if we don't have the foundation of the house solid, where we understand 
all of those metrics, if not more, and somebody who can analyze them to know what to do with the information, whether it's good or bad, you know, so that we can make an informed decision. So that's why it's important to, you know, again, come from, you know, learn it if you don't know it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then there's something called KPIs. Can you explain for us? Um, may yeah. not be familiar with the term KPIs. Sure. It stands for key performance indicator. And the best way to simplify the term is just, it is a measurement of time, right? Your key performance indicators can mean many things, but where are you today? You know, where do you want to be? And then when you look at the departments within your organization, there are very specific KPIs that must be met in order to achieve the goals that you're looking for. And the hard part in the industry is most people don't know what they are. So they're operating blindly, hoping it works, Again, you know, perhaps being busy, not being profitable or, you know, compensating, but perhaps, you know, not the right way where it's productive for the business and for the provider. So the KPIs that that are in aesthetic medicine are really important to know. Right. And I, I love it that you um, make it a measurement of time because time is money and and uh, we want to make the best use of our time, uh, the most profitable use of our time. So can you uh, tell us some of the top KPIs that most medical spas need to keep track of? Yeah. I mean, gosh, there's so many things. But um, if we're looking at like what a typical med spa room should generate, again, every state is very different in terms of what providers can and can't do. But a medical spa room should do around 600 to over 1,000 an hour. Um, doing medical treatments. And what I mean by that is right, injectables and body contouring, skin tightening, things like that. If you're an esthetician, doing facials, I don't mean medical esthetician or estheticians that can do medical procedures that starts to fluctuate the, the KPI and the revenue per hour. But a, a, an esthetician should do around 250 to 350. Um, surgeons should do over 3000 an hour. Even just those alone, you know, gross profit should be well over 50%. And I say gross because we didn't pay labor on those things. Mm -hmm. So I love now when you just said time is money, I always ask my audience, like, what do you, what do you think that we sell? It's interesting because you'll get, I'll get several terms and they're right. And they're mm -hmm. all right. We sell happiness. We sell experience. We sell results. We sell outcome, but we sell time. Yes. That really is what we sell. We can't get it back. So if we don't know the KPIs and we're just in the room, right, functioning, right. Like patients yeah. all day, uh -huh. am I, are you questioning like, right, how many patients am I seeing? What are they spending? How often do they return? Right. What is my revenue per hour? Am I meeting the benchmark? Am I not? And once you know what the benchmarks are, you can back into the data to say, I'm short here, or I've been wasting my time doing these procedures that don't yield the highest return on investment. And maybe I'm going to change my, my marketing efforts and focus on these things that do. So it's like a, it's like, a, it's like a spoke in a wheel. When you know these things, it's very powerful, right? It's very, it's like financial freedom to be able to make the changes where we've seen practices grow multi, multi millions of dollars when they know like what they're actually looking at and what, what to change. Right. And you gave us some numbers. I imagine they're benchmark numbers, like $3,000 yeah. an hour for a surgeon mm -hmm. and um, several hundred dollars for other practitioners within the practice. Are those nationwide benchmarks? They are. They are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and so if um, a med spa doesn't know whether or not they're measuring up, <laughs> then they should find out. Yeah. And I always I invite people. I'm like, you know, please, mm -hmm. if you don't know how to do the equation, it's, you know, I'm happy to share that with you, but you really need to go figure it out to say, okay, am I, what is my baseline today? Be, the only way to move and grow is if you know that. Right. Otherwise people are wondering where in a, in a market now that's becoming very saturated mm -hmm. and very commoditized, the, the only way to grow and compete, it can't be about cheapening your brand or reducing the price or offering discounts that we're not in the discounting business. And it's yeah. shame on shame on anyone that feels they have to do that because your time is worth it. Your expertise, your overhead, you should not have to feel like you have to diminish yourself because mm -hmm. somebody can't afford it. They will yeah. pay for it. 
right? They will definitely pay for what they feel is valuable. And if people are working too hard and not making enough profit, then that would be incentive to try and find out what is the reason, what's mm -hmm. the cause. And so right. it, it dawns on me that there are sev several med spa practitioners and owners who don't know their numbers. And can you let us know uh, some of the reasons you have come across yeah. as why? I mean, I, honestly, you know, no, no and I, I say this in a little quiz, 90%. Of aesthetic practices, not even just med spas, don't measure the data. Ninety percent. Ninety percent. That's a lot of people, and and all you know, and I'm and I'm that that's no criticism. I'm fortunate to do what we do and be able to help people understand and navigate through muddy waters. They don't teach you the business side of aesthetic medicine, so you come out. You're an amazing provider. You want to have big dreams and big goals and do good work doing good work is great, but in order to have a sustainable company where patients want to come back. So mm -hmm. I think one, that's, that, that's one people don't know what to do, how to measure it. Where do I look? There's so much information. The mm -hmm. second thing is there's the, the practice management systems out there. There's several, probably the, the top four or five in aesthetic medicine, but the data is not standardized. So if somebody has next tech versus Simplast versus aesthetic record versus patient now, the way you do it and the way I do it could be very different. So mm -hmm. then it just becomes garbage in and garbage out. <laughs> yeah. But as a consultant for so many years, we would analyze shitty data. Yeah. Because it's fragmented. Mm -hmm. So the industry alone doesn't have standardization of, of data. Right? Oh, right. And then the third is that training. Like where does anyone go to get training? You know, I wrote courses and everyone knows, I mean, I've written, right. We've written sales training courses and our financial courses. And I, we wrote them and I launched the tr sales training one, one out of my own core background for 25 plus years selling right. and mm -hmm. managing teams. But how can we hire people within a practice, but not train them? And look, people can say, well, I'm not a salesperson and that's not what I do. But you are. We sell every day. We sell our kids. We sell our spouses. We sell to our friends. We sell getting into college, buying a home. We sell every day. And yes. what we're doing is we, we so there's no training. The third thing is we're, we're lacking the training, the fundamental training for respective roles within the practice. How do we better do our job? And then what KPI am I tied to? So if you're a front desk, I hate to say it, for concierge, it's one of the most important roles within a practice. How mm -hmm. one of the most important roles right. and how, how do we get them to answer the phone, like qualify the caller, ask the mm -hmm. right questions, handle objections, talk about features and benefits, credential, the practice credential, the provider, like understand what treatments I just rattled off nine things they have to know how to do. Otherwise the practice is spending money to get the phone to ring or for a web lead to come in mm -hmm. and, and the patient doesn't convert. And now we have to know what our patient acquisition cost is. Right. And so, then the retention piece. So the person at the front desk is also the first impression mm -hmm. coming in the door. So making them feel right at home, giving them that special experience at a practice. Yeah. Yeah. So important. Absolutely. Right. So you do um, work with individual med spas to help them with these skills. I do. I do. I mean, obviously I've, I've, I still have Terry Ross consulting. So some people prefer mm -hmm. that I come out to the practice for a couple of days and do sales training, which I'm going to do and, <laughs> uh, you know, in a week in Houston with a big yes, platform. I know you're in such demand. <laughs> Invaded, obviously Apex platform was developed in the middle of COVID right from Terry Ross consulting, which yes. allows us to reach and help more people with the same methodologies and in, in training philosophies that, that I have, yes. um, but, but, but inside of a, a practice optimization platform where people can have access to all of the training, all of the data, all of the KPIs, benchmarking tools, and then private and then coaching group coaching from our team. Right. So you can't go to every single individual medical spot yourself. So you, you, just, you created a system where yeah. it's part of the, yes. yeah. the APX platform. Um, and by the way, everyone, if you want to know more about the APX platform, I do have 
an ebook that was made available to us from Terry and just uh, request, um, email me and I'll send it out to you. It's free. And it's so packed with valuable information, some of which Terry is covering today. Mm -hmm. So back to APX. Yep. That's an exciting transition that you've taken. Thank you. Yes. Please tell us more about APX. I, I laugh at myself, actually, because I, I was like, I don't even know what SaaS meant, right? So <laughs> Software as a service. So, I mean, Apex really, it is. It's a, it's a practice performance system, practice mm -hmm. optimization. And we called it that because people can resonate with the words. If you identify that you're suffering in any of the areas that I just talked about, right? You're training your staff, your culture, your leadership, your data, your KPIs, your conversions, your marketing, your metrics, your revenue, gross profit. I could go on and on and on what we solve but that mm -hmm. is what, that is what we solve. And we looked at identifying these eight blocks of components and they are tied to a unique uh, identifier within the platform so that people do have the training courses. There's, uh, you know, accountability metrics built in. They can take a test. They can have downloadable assets. No one can ever say, I don't know how to do my job. Because how to do your job is in the in the platform. There are live training courses either from myself or my team. And then it parlays into financial analytical calculators that all of the things I talked about that people don't know how to do, we yeah. dumbed it down. We, we, we do it. We've done it for you. So all the calculators, you're coached on what data to put in there. It spits out information, which practices are like, oh, my God, I had no idea. It's so rewarding. And then it parlays into a KPI dashboard. So in real time, you can actually measure what's working and what's not with the standardized KPIs that we believe are the right things to measure. And then uh, within every single month, there's more than 10, I believe, 10 group coaching calls. And we've really, people know it's Terry's tribe. Um, we really are a family and a community of people that don't just learn from our team, but learn, learn from others as well. You know, we're all, we're all in this together. You know, the rising tides lift all boats. Let's talk about things together and let's share best practices so that we all win. So every member on a step on, in, on the team can mm -hmm. take part of this training and benefit. So the whole practice, the whole clinic can mm -hmm. benefit because every single person has a training module that yes. applies to their role mm -hmm. inside of the practice. And then you they're all coordinated, um, measured, mm -hmm. so that there can be some conversation around any issues that might arise or even a pats on the back for work that's yeah. being done very well mm -hmm. uh, on both sides. So continuously improving as a team, the coherent, the cohesiveness I can feel that can come out of an application like APX is powerful. Yes, thank you. I thank you. You know, it's interesting because truly that's how we feel. Like we know the work it's done. We know the impact it has had, you, you know, it's often interesting, you know, look, time is valuable to all of us. We have families and friends and partners, but if people really want to grow the business, it, you have to invest time. Just like you went to college and you studied your craft to, to be a good provider or a good doctor. You know, we work on being a good parent, whatever it is, we, we invest in learning, right? You know, you have an MBA, like we didn't get it. Nobody, <laughs> nobody waved us, uh, you know, the magic wand and told us how to do it. No. And I think one thing that's interesting is that as much as it can help people, you know, it's often, well, how long is it going to take? How much work do I have to do? And it's interesting when I hear it, because we, I know the answers and I can defend right? What that might be, but it really comes down to, you know, how, what, you know, what, what is the value that you put on your business or the mm -hmm. value you put on yourself or the value yeah. on scaling in your team? And if it's an area that you struggle with, I don't know about you, like I have always hired coaches and mentors. Mm -hmm. and I constantly am learning. I never want to be the smartest person in the room, but I, I certainly want to learn, you know, their strength and vulnerability and that's, that's where we see exponential change when practices of any level, and we've had some of the highest key opinion leaders in the country been in for 30 years, ready to go sell, but they're like, no, we want to work with you. We know we need help. So it can do horrible for things, but somebody has to be really ready to commit and hold people accountable.
Yes, and, and that's and that's terrific because even the top athletes in the world, yeah. they have coaches. They continuously yeah. <laughs> seek right to to be better and better. Um, Tom Brady had a coach. Um, yeah. who was the I love it. I'm like he's right. To Tiger, what think about these athletes, right? It's not just my one swing and I'm done. And oh, I I, I did it. I mean, how do they every day, all hours and hours and hours? Mm -hmm. I, um, we just came off of our four us summit, which is a yeah. uh, really a business conference, but. One yes. one of the slides I showed was that, you know, people talk about massive action and these big, huge changes, but it doesn't have to be that. It's a 1% difference. And so if every day you do 1% of practicing something that you can approve upon by the end of the year, it's a 40% change in mm -hmm. that area. And that's a lot. So I, I want you to guys, to, you know, thank you all for tuning in and for listening. It, this shouldn't be scary, but if you are invested in your company and in your patients and in your career development, mm -hmm. this is the time that we have to say, shit, I don't, I do suck in this area. Right? Yeah. I could be better over here. <laughs> and how do I do that? And what am I willing to do? And can I carve out an hour or 30 minutes or whatever it is to get to that small incremental change? Cause it feels really good. Yes, that's right. And you have the, the fine eye, the trained eye with all of, with your wonderful experience and, and you bring and there's only so much of you that can be that can go around. And although you do uh, provide individual coaching for each practice, you have the 4S Summit. Yeah. That's another magnificent, wonderful service you provide yeah. for the medical spa aesthetics industry. Tell us some more about that. Thank you so much, Janelle. Great question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really was designed. We, I think we launched our first one in May mm -hmm. and it's right. The aesthetic success. Um, and while I am again, blessed and honored to work with all of the societies and speak at these conferences, mm -hmm. what still was coming up from most everyone, or how do we work with your mm -hmm. team? And can you come to my practice? And I'm still struggling. And I took all these notes and I don't, I don't know what to do. Where do I start? Mm -hmm. More importantly, how do I do it? Mm -hmm. How do I do it? I can speak on my own behalf. I, I, if I'm lecturing all over the country, I can talk for 15 or 20 minutes. And sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and blessed to have an hour. Mm -hmm. But then, then what happens? People go back and they're just confused. They don't mm -hmm. know where to start. And if mm -hmm. they weren't trained by the things we talked about, mm -hmm. get back overwhelmed and nothing happens. There's zero action, zero execution. So the 4S Summit, it's myself, Isaac Musley, my co-CEO in Apex, and Dr. Renato Saltz, a world-renowned plastic surgeon in Salt Lake City with two locations. He's been the past president of both the international uh, societies as well as the American societies. We three are the owners, and it was honestly to just take people to the next level. Next level, meaning if you want to scale, if you mm -hmm. are stuck, right? Certainly Apex can be the supporting factor for you on a long-term basis, right? For a three-day intensive, down and dirty, right? Bring your PL, bring your balance sheet, bring your Excel, bring your team, like be ready to learn. I mean, we worked 15, 16 hours a day. The feedback was astronomical. And, and that's really what it is. How do we give people the blueprint of mm -hmm. exactly how to do it so that mm -hmm. when they go back to their practice, they they know they have they have the tools yes. what to do. Right. They have direction and they have they've been blessed. <laughs> and also um email Terry at Terry yes. TerryRoth.com. Wow, you you've done so much for the industry, Thank Terry. You so much. I'm very, very grateful for learning from you and for having you in our presence. And, and you are um, a luminary. Oh, in my gosh. Saying thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, I, I posted, I'm sure. And I think you commented the other day that I and everyone should have a purpose. And yes. other than my daughter, uh, every, yeah. you know, you and the people listening and oh, the followers, so the clients, you guys really are my purpose for all of this. So, and the society is giving me that opportunity to, to be part of that. So right, well, you're so gracious. I'm just curious. Um, could you give us some examples of med spas that you've helped? Yeah. Oh, that'd be lovely. Yeah. Back of case studies, but I, I mean, I don't even know where to start. There is, there are so many, I mean, I mean, practices have grown really, you know, many of our practices mm -hmm. have grown recently mm -hmm. to private equity, 
you know, grown two and a half, three million dollars a year. Some people that were solo practitioners, afraid to charge a consult fee. Everybody knows how I believe in that. And, you know, the, or, or, or looking at retail and doing a treatment plan. Now they're, they're working less, making way more money. I mean, mm -hmm. again, I'm happy to send the deck. We have just of hundreds of happy clients. Oh. Well, please do. I'll, I'll be happy to help share. Yeah. Are there are there maybe one or two or three that come to mind that like specific really practices? Kind of your what? Like, yes, uh, examples of how knowing their numbers really turn them around. And yeah, what, I mean, this the, you know the Olam girls they were featured on the cover of Forbes. Um, Amanda Satterwhite grew three and a half million. I mean, I could. And these are just people that. They're all smart business people. Two mm -hmm. things that people need to focus on. When you understand, one, your service mix, diversification. So what mm -hmm. service do you, do you offer in mm -hmm. what category? I always state there's riches in the niches. You don't have to be everything to everybody, but you certainly cannot be spending your time all day doing laser hair removal. That's not going to cut mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you're a surgeon, you know, what are you doing to add on to the procedure to generate more revenue? So when I talked about profit per procedure or revenue per hour, those are two KPIs that if you did nothing else, literally for the next quarter, Q4, even mm -hmm. if we all believe it's the highest revenue generating quarter, it is. But again, holidays, what's happening in the economy, the war right now. Look, we're in we're in a tough gas prices are ridiculous. Yeah. We have got to be smart. So if you want to, if you're, you know, listening to this one, I do invite you, please reach out to me, um, you know, all of my social channels. I have a podcast in touch with Terry. I give such valuable information. I invite you to listen to it. It's free, obviously. But if you understand your service mix and then you start to look and say, okay, what is my gross profit? When you know what that is, you're going to quickly identify if things make you money or they don't. Right then and there, you can literally say, well, what, what changes can I make? I either need to right, be more efficient with my time, charge more, or or my right, or, or eliminate eliminate it altogether. Maybe it's dragging you down. Mm -hmm. Then you look at how you're paying somebody. Cost of labor should be under 20%. People don't know that. Hmm. Above the line and under 20% if it's tied to a, a, a treatment. Mm -hmm. This is where compensation gets out of whack. Then you mm -hmm. look at revenue per hour. We look at it three ways. Mm -hmm. Revenue per hour as a company, revenue per hour by service category, revenue per hour by provider. Yes. Have a benchmark. If you don't know what that is, then you have no idea if I'm Nurse Terry or Dr. Terry or whatever I am mm -hmm. in a room, am I doing good or bad? Maybe somebody thinks I'm busy all day, but am I making 400 grand or could I be making a million dollars? Right. You don't back into what I'm doing in the room all day or the kind of patients I'm seeing or if I'm doing a treatment plan or what services I'm doing, then you don't know. And then it just appears I'm busy making X amount of money right. that I could have trip. I could have, you know, three, three X that revenue. So those are two KPIs that have all those practices that I named. Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, we, we always do a practice assessment. It's the health of the business. That's how we uncover. I never say what's wrong. Areas of opportunity. When we uncover them, we can quickly tell you what's working and what's not and what to change. And if you change it and then you take the training courses and you know what to do, how to mm -hmm. sell, how to convert, how to do a consultation, how to close, how to qualify. If you study what we teach, everything comes together because the data doesn't lie. That's right. The data doesn't lie. Yeah. And, and um, so... Also, though, if a procedure doesn't seem to be right or profitable for a practice, maybe they have a different clientele who's expecting other kinds of services, not the one that the medical spa thinks. Yeah. This helps identify, uh, it helps them prioritize the services. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And, and really say, wait a minute, why? God, you know, people are such a wow factor. And it's such a humbling place when they're like, oh my God, Terry, I had no idea I've been spending all my time doing this thing that makes me no money. And right. then they're like, oh God, I, I wish I would have known this years ago. <laughs> right. Well, um, time that wasn't making money and that was yeah, actually absolutely. losing 
money for a practice. So that's um, um, it's important to identify those early and or fix it. Yeah, or get rid of it. Right. right? <laughs> but at least we can correct it and mm-hmm. make an informed decisions. That was one of your points. How do people make informed decisions? When you asked me in the very beginning, why is data important? It is the only way anyone can make any kind of decision. This isn't about my heart and my feeling. It is about the facts. Mm-hmm. And if you want to make money and you want a good culture and you want your team to stay, right, mm-hmm. and be loyal to you and you want your patients to return to you, there's one thing about humble and, you know, human connection and customer service. It's another when you have those qualities perfected or being still continuously worked on right. because you're not willing to settle for mediocrity or average company. But when you say, okay, this is what works. This doesn't, I'm going to eliminate this, do more of this, reallocate my marketing dollars, compensate this way. It's all like a puzzle piece. The pieces all come together. Just, you just see changes and growth quickly. Otherwise, we're all going to be stuck here in the same space, wanting something different, but not willing to do the work to make it change. To make a change or um, not know that you have to make a change yeah. to begin with. Yeah. I'm realizing some of the, the ways that also a successful uh, practice and the culture shows up is in retention, the mm-hmm. retention of the, of the patients. Yeah. Um, is that also a metric that needs to be paid attention to? Oh my gosh, 100%. I mean, this the average retention rate is around 65%, which mm-hmm. isn't bad. Um, the question I would, you know, challenge everybody is, you know, you may have your people that come see you all the time, right? Every quarter, every month, whatever it is for whatever treatment. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. urge you to challenge, you know, and challenge yourself, run a report. Now, retention's hard to run in most softwares. But there is a way to see the next appointment if you're pre-booking. So do your patients come in for the same treatment? Which means I make I may just get my Botox and my fillers. Maybe I just get my facials. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. fascinating because I say that there's, it, you know, it's about less is more. You want less people in the door, but you want to get more. You want to maximize the revenue that you're generating from me. And the only way to do that is to know how often I come back. What is my average invoice? What is my average spend? Mm-hmm. What am I spending it on? Do I come mm-hmm. back for other things? Right. If I don't, that's an educational problem right there. Right. So start right. to identify and say, well, God, maybe Nell didn't even know because the statistics have come back that over 40%, up 40 to 60% of patients said that they did not know the practice offered these other things. Oh, yes. <laughs> back, back to like, I don't want to be salesy. Well, you mm-hmm. have to inform. We're not selling anything. You right. are your clients on what services your place offers, period. And, and how to best achieve their objectives yeah. um, to get the results that they want. So educating a patient yeah. about the options that you have available to them, which mm-hmm. come out in a in an interview or uh, um, to find out what options a patient has available to them to get the res- a plan, a plan right. of action that can keep the patient at a practice in the uh, door, to, uh, right, to, uh, right, you know, in the door, and and keep coming back. Mm-hmm. Not only that, though, they have such a great experience at the medical spa that they tell their friends and family about the medical right. spa. Right, of course, it yeah. doesn't take long. I teach; it's about thirty-four patients mm-hmm. to get to. That is not a lot of people. <laughs> if you do it right, yeah, doing it right means that um, everyone in the practice they're they're communicating about a patient. They're, yeah. co- they're coordinated and they're cooperating and there are these upsell opportunities, yeah. cross-sell opportunities. And it takes training to for each of the providers to recognize when there's another option that is available or an yeah. add-on that can be added uh, to a patient's uh, plan. Correct? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I know you teach all of that. So that yeah. there's, so the, and this is the sales Training. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this, the sales uh, skill is another skill that the practitioners and the providers are gaining and you help them learn these skills. I do. It's one thing to be, a, again, a good provider and be able to identify the symptom and the treatment. But mm-hmm. I teach, you know, patients don't buy, you know, the tangible pen, right? I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not buying the thing. 
So where most people lack is the ability mm-hmm. to ask the right questions to get the client to an emotional response. Mm-hmm. I do buy, patients will buy based on emotional, based on a visceral response. They want an outcome. So I'm going to buy the way the breast right augmentation is good because I'm going to look better in my bikini right? or I'm going to do my laser resurfacing and my injectables because I want to look, you know, 10 years younger, whatever it is, but we have yeah. to get down to asking the right questions, which is what I teach. And I'm mm-hmm. like, if you do nothing else, ask these 11 questions in the exact way that I tell you to ask them. Don't oh, say anything. Exactly. Don't, <laughs> don't <laughs> wait till you're done. <laughs> and it's, very, it's very powerful and it's, life-changing from a consultation perspective. I'm sure. So when you're asking questions and you sit back, you give your patient room yeah. to maneuver. They they can have an internal conversation and then come out with something honest. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to tell you, like, mm-hmm. I, I tell my team the same thing. Someone's ability to listen intently and ask good questions. Mm-hmm. The patient will ultimately tell you exactly what they're looking for, how bad it bothers them, how committed are they to wanting to get it done, what they can afford to do, again, how it affects their life. Now you can build a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. But I'm only saying, oh, now, okay, you're here for fine lines and wrinkles and I can do one, two, three and ABC. But we all know the answer. We all know what the patient might need. But then we don't, again, we don't listen enough. We talk too much or the consultation's too short of time. I don't know enough about you mm-hmm. that it becomes, I'm just treating the symptom I'm right. really down to the root of a problem, which means I won't retain you because I can do your Botox and filler and you'll be happy today. It doesn't mean you're going to come back. Right, 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 right. And so follow-up is important and, and having a, a complete end-to-end concierge experience is, is so important too. So we, we talked a bit about the operations of a med spa and how knowing the financials and the, the KPIs and the performance of uh, providers I mean, when it comes to retaining clients, patients, or or upselling them. What about um, equipment? Is there? Do you help medical spa owners know when to buy, lease, or not buy or lease a piece of equipment? The buying and the leasing is a personal, you know, a personal, I guess, decision. What we help them do is identify, I mean, our team's opened up a hundred practices across the country, which is in our startup medical program. So if people are listening and you have a desire to start or expand, that's a different Mm -hmm. program that is within Apex run by two of our senior consultants. But people will ask us, Terry, what, what do I buy? Or when do I buy it? Well, if a machine is at a certain co- level of capacity, probably running at set 65 to 70%, right. you could buy something else. Now, again, then they say, well, but then it's a matter of, can I afford it? And since I come from that corporate space, it's not about the reps telling you, hey, now, you know, do 30 procedures and you're going to pay it off. Well, it doesn't really work like that, right? Again, there's cost of, there's the lease, the warranty, labor, cost of goods. There's a lot of things to run that machine. So it can't just sit in the right. corner gathering dust before somebody buys something. You should very much, you know, do a survey monkey, ask your patients, right? Do a survey monkey of your entire database, ask them, are they interested in this, this service category or this device? You know, mm-hmm. they'd be getting it someplace else. Would they transition and come to you? You're going to get a lot of information. So don't just go buy it because it's the hot new mm-hmm. shiny thing. Or direct mm-hmm. consumer from a company. Does it fit your business model? Does it fit your right. vision and mission? Right. Who is your avatar client? I mean, talking to a 25-year-old versus a 50-year-old are two different conversations. What is your demographic? How much do they make? Again, how often do I come back? What do I spend? That's going to allow you to have a strategic marketing plan or at least put one together before mm-hmm. you go buy something. Right. Otherwise, then you're wondering, you know, I, I have, we have so many very sad stories well that have went out or they're out at a conference Mm -hmm. and again with all love and respect to the companies and i speak for many of them too and i get it some of these are phenomenal organizations making great devices but not if somebody can't afford them not if you don't have the patience to support it and you don't have the revenue 
to support it or the cash flow to support it. And then people go out and they're like, oh my God, Terry, I went and bought a half a million dollars worth of stuff and I can't pay it and I don't have any people. Oh my and gosh. It's, it's very sad and it's not uncommon though. So I, you know, I want people to just, you know, take a minute and just really, again, call us, let us help you with, again, that practice assessment or just be smart. I really want people to think long and hard about how much cash do you have in the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have three to six months reserves? How mm -hmm. are you paying providers? What can you afford to do? How are you, what are you spending in marketing? How are you getting people? Because that's the other, the very inflated thing on the PL. The marketing spend is way out of whack mm -hmm. completely. And yet they don't track it. They don't know where the callers come from, how many leads, what they spend. It's a mess, you know. <laughs> it's like throwing the spaghetti against the proverbial oh, wall right. and seeing what sticks. And my gosh, yeah. that could be very risky for any business. <laughs> yeah. And again, oh. this is all with such love that people are like, and I hope that this is so valuable for people because I, we, our only intention and why is so that people are like, oh my God, that is me. And I did make these mistakes or I, or I'm not that great at this, but I want to get better. Or I want to stop the bleeding or, or, or I want to make another $3 million and I'm kicking ass and maybe hey. too, it doesn't matter. But I don't know anybody. If I asked you, if I could help you grow a million to three a year, are you going to say no? Right. Mm -hmm. If I save you time and money, mm -hmm. avoid costly mistakes, why would anyone say no to that? that that's right. That's exactly right. You're increasing the profit profitability. And I certainly, shit, like I said, I pay for coaches because I want to learn some stuff. <laughs> do I? <laughs> Continuously growing. You right. know? Always wanting to be better. Yeah, always. And also, you mentioned a checklist. Can you talk more about that checklist that you, is this is uh, done at the initial? It, yeah, it's a um, it's a practice assessment. Mm -hmm. And when we originally wrote it, my God, it was like 25 pages. Oh. It's very robust. Um, but it's the only way. And it, and it does two things. It's very enlightening when the practices have to fill it out because mm -hmm. you can see how much they know and what they mm -hmm. don't know, which is okay. A lot of times mm -hmm. they don't know. And, mm -hmm. it, and they may or may not know that they don't know. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Then we help them figure it out. But mm -hmm. it goes into every department, whether it's, again, equipment, vision, mission, culture, team, compensation, revenue per hour, all, uh, it, marketing, equipment, software, practice management, CRMs, your POS. I mean, I can go on and on. We, 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 yeah. There's not a, a, you know, a sheet that we do not uncover. And then right. we write a gap analysis report. You touch all aspects of the yeah. business. <laughs> it's all the entire practice. And then you are, and we have a 90 minute call with you and we analyze the data and then we roll it out to you. We basically tell you what mm -hmm. our findings are and how to correct. Right, 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 right. Yeah, awesome. What about if a practice is ready to expand to another location? Yeah. Do you have any advice? I, that's kind of a loaded question. Sure. I mean, they may say, Terry, when is somebody ready to expand? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things. I mean, do you have an opportunity to expand in your current location? You know, I think again, if a practice is running at, you know, depending on space, you know, if you're tapped out in space and square footage and you're running at an 80% capacity, you could expand, mm -hmm. right? By mm -hmm. buying another location that would probably lend right into our startup program because we always want to look at demographics, feasibility, a competitive analysis, right? Is the market ripe? What kind of demographics live there? It's not just, hey, I'm going to go over into Beverly Hills now and open, get some brick and mortar. That's where sometimes it is that philosophy. It's not that simple. You really do want to make sure you're, you have an opportunity to thrive and you're not butting up against, you know, neighbors. Like, again, I use Beverly Hills in a three mile radius. There's hundreds, three, 400 people all roughly doing the same thing. Market conditions. But yes, we, we definitely help them and, or advise them one way or the other. Right. No, that's so valuable. Uh, and um, potentially also identifying other locations that might be more. Uh, yeah, I do have to give a shout out. My team is just incredible. I always say there's no I. There's no I in team. I could not do any of this without them. They are so special to me. The most brilliant people that I could work with too. I learn from them too every day. So, Well, the gratitude is, 
these chills from the inside out. Um, Terry, and thank you for this is so inspiring. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. I mean, I'm honored to be here. I love what you're doing. And I think this oh, thank is just, you. you know, again, we're all here to support each other and to, to rise to the best that we can be. Absolutely. And this industry is exploding. Yeah. Do you have any, so the competition is really. It's fierce. It's fierce. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think with insurance-based businesses suffering, mm -hmm. there are a lot of, look, I mean, family practice, internal med, no OB gin, mm -hmm. dentist, mm -hmm. I had a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. the other day. Really the only advice I can give is, you know, what I said earlier, you know, what, why, what is your why? Like, why do you want to get into the space and just not being ignorant to feel that it's so simple to get into this business, right? You know, AMSPA obviously is a great resource from a compliance and a legal. There's a, there's a right way to do this and there is very much a wrong way. And if you're interested to get into it and uh, just, just do it right, right? Invest in the things just like you did your career, invest in being legal, staying within compliance, working with consultants like us so that you are on the right path of mm -hmm. great success, mm -hmm. right? And Amanda Satterwhite, when you asked me earlier, she was an ER doctor who was working nights in the hospital, like grinding away. And I met her, God, it's probably been two years ago at an AMSPA boot camp in Boston. And she's thriving. Two and a half years she's been in business, awesome. well over 4 million, second location. Like those success stories are what help. Like that, it like makes me elated, brings tears to my eyes. You know, mm -hmm. this guy came from uh, South Africa to our 4S summit, 19 clinics. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And when you yeah. hear things like that, it's like, that's really when it's so again, you know, just investing in, you know, investing really in, into what's going to make you successful. Right. And having your eyes wide open and yeah. a business plan. Oh my God, right. <laughs> having you know, having a business plan. plan. Knowing your startup costs, right? Again, knowing that's the other sad thing. People think, you mm -hmm. know, hey, I have 50 grand and I, I want to go do this. And, you know, mm -hmm. I hate to say maybe, you know, maybe we can get a run, one room show. I mean, look at there's opportunities to do that. Again, how much cash reserve do you have and how much is it going to cost you? And what is the overhead every day? What's your break even point? Uh, when are when do you bring on someone new? Like, what are you going to start with? How do you price those services? There's so many, so many, so many things right. that I just don't think, especially if you come from outside of the aesthetic industry that you don't know that, and I'm all for it. We want, that's what we're here for, right? If somebody wants to get into the space, amen, I want you to, too. We want you to just do it right. Right. Do it right. Um, and really be realistic um, about the competition, the area you're serving, yeah. whether or not you have the strongest, strong enough why, because it can be tough to start up most any business. So yeah. what would you say is the usual break-even time line, would you say? Break-even is hard because it really depends on you know, the, the clients, the marketing, there's so many factors. I would say that the startup costs are anywhere from, you know, I think the AMSPA report showed around 350. We see it's probably about 1.5 million. Now, depending on somebody's business model, you can be, you can just be a solo provider doing something in, you know, two rooms or one room renting. It's going to yeah. different for, it's going to be different for everybody. So I always say there's, you know, different ways to, to skin the cat or many ways I should say. And just making sure that you have the right, again, the right contracts, the right standard operating procedures, the right medical director. This isn't like I go buy a template off the internet and I'm filling in the blanks by myself. Like that's right. not, we we fix so many problems for people trying to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. This is the time to be cheap or try mm -hmm. to figure it out because your friend told you or you Googled it online it doesn't work. It doesn't really work like that. And that is no. like my honest, humble heart. There's just too many mistakes. And then people wonder why they've started a business and they're not making money and they can't afford to pay the bills. And then, then they call us. Uh -huh. I would rather people be right prepared and knowledgeable in the beginning of what they can expect. Right. And, and, and that, that in of itself, when you work with 
And I say this about myself, I know about my children, my daughter. I mean, I have mm-hmm. coaches for her. You know, I don't, I'm not an expert in Taekwondo. I don't know how to do it. I'm not a soccer coach. And so I, you know, we're, I mean, we all invest in the things that cost it. But I say there's a difference between an investment, which yields a return versus an expense. And so I think that working with experts is definitely an investment because the savings you're going to get in the long run will far outweigh what that investment was. Right. In, especially in this very, it's becoming even more complex with private equity um, and taking a big interest yeah. in acquiring medical spas. There's the competition has really taken another turn. So there's that, that is another kind of pitfall that people need to be prepared for. Well, if they have a desire to sell, and I know nobody mm-hmm. wants to work until they're 90 or 100 and you know shut the doors, right. <laughs> private equity does look for very specific things. So yes, you know, they- we're helping them get their house in order, the books clean, structured, uh, so that they can eventually be operating with that sustainable revenue that they'll right. eventually be able to sell for the multiples they're looking for. Absolutely. Terry, you've been so generous with your time. I, I, I could talk for a long time. I hope <laughs> with you. Um, and I only feel like we've just been, even though we've talked for almost an hour, yeah. we just scratched the surface. And if, if you're willing, I'd love to have you again. I would um, love that. Um, of course. Yes, you're, you're such a wealth of information you. and you're a beautiful human being. We just uh, really adore you. <laughs> oh, I appreciate you so much. Thank you now for having me. Thank you everyone you know, grateful for the opportunity and would love to hear from you again, whether it's on the podcast or my Instagram, or you're going to email me, please, you know, my door is always wide open. So thank you now. Fabulous. Um, Any parting words that you'd like to, any takeaways you'd like to leave with our audience? Yeah, no, just again, thanks for tuning in and listening. You know, I, I always say, if you've invested in watching this hour, that means you, you know, you have a desire and a hunger and a need for wanting more and to, to, to do more. Um, so again, I invite you to visit Terry Ross Consulting, Apex Platform. Find me on Instagram, which is Terry Ross Consulting. DM me. The YouTube is uh, the same and the podcast is in touch with Terry. So Thank you so much again. All right. Thank you. All right. So we'll say goodbye until later. And Terry, thank you. And have a wonderful evening. You take care too. Bye. Hello again, everybody. Uh, My gosh, wasn't that fabulous? She shared so much with us. And I just am really grateful.